we have two speakers, uh, Genevieve Gizanetti from Italy, and then we have uh, Frank Mohan from Berkeley. And uh, yes, yeah, so the okay. <coughs> Good afternoon. And what I will talk today, it's about the, as you can see from the title, data intensive biology and data provenance graph. Uh, the idea is that data intensive uh, biology introduces a sort of paradigm shift in, uh, in what you can do on the, for, from the computational side in biology. And basically, what happens is that to extract biologically interesting information, you have to have um, potentially very deep uh, stacks of processing on top of raw digital data. And this has, of course, lots of advantages, but also introduce interesting uh, new aspects in data management and analysis that I will briefly will try to discuss here. Uh, I will touch, but just in passing, what we did on Hadoop and related things, so, but I will be happy to discuss afterwards. Now, let, let's have some, a little bit of context. Uh, the reason we are interested in these things, in uh, data intensive computing and related to biology, is because um, we are uh, collaborating with the biologists in large-scale population studies in Sardinia. Sardinia it's, um, has what is called a bottleneck effect in this population. Somewhere like about 7,000 years ago or so, there has been um, a drastic reduction in the population. And that has resulted in that a population that's uh, deriving from few funding ancestors, which has a more uniform, homogenic, uh, more homogeneous genetic profile. And also due to the, uh, to, to the way the land is uh, it's made, I mean, lots of hills and uh, mountains, hills and valleys, you know, recluded, secluded valleys, there have been um, geographic insulation and small group of people within this. And that's increased the frequency of variants that could be rare in a uh, broader population. It also yeah, it provides a uniform environment from the point of view of all diet, lifestyle, and everything else within these groups. And on top of that, it's a highly documented population since it's been, uh, uh, everything has been registered by thousands of years. I mean, definitely tens of centuries, well, thousands of years or so. Uh, as examples of studies that have been done, one is as to the studies that have to do with autoimmune diseases. Uh, Sardinia has uh, particularly high incidence in autoimmune diseases like diabetes uh, type 1 and multiple sclerosis. If you look at the graph, well, you see there is a, a gradient that goes from northern country down south, and it, red it's uh, bad and gray it's okay. And so yeah, it's, it just comes back up in the map with a very high incident. And uh, there is uh, ongoing studies with uh, to, um, based on a, on a cohort, about 4,000 people uh, affected, uh, 4,000 healthy volunteers that's being conducted by CNR. CNR is the, the National Research Council, the Italian National Research Country, uh, Council, uh, IRGB. It's the uh, specific lab in Sardinia close to where we are, which we, we are collaborating with. And uh, the idea is that on that group of people that have done a very extensive measurement of almost everything we could, and uh, very in particular do high resolution genotyping up to the genome sequence and so on. Uh, the, the, Again, this is an example of a high resolution characterization of variability within, the, the result is a high resolution characterization of variability within the Sardinia population. The other example is Progenia, which is a joint study between NIH, uh, actually the uh, NIA, the National Institute of Aging, and CNR, on where they, they're taking a particular population uh, um, in a valley on the east, of more or less the middle east of Sardinia, where, uh, differently from before, where they have a problem with the disease. Now, this is a place which has a very long life expectancy. It's one of the places in, in the world with a very, um, very good life expectancy. And so what we basically is done there is they took the whole population, about 6,000 people, and they have been studying with lots, like hundreds of traits of various kinds, and, uh, the, uh, and all the possible technologies from uh, microarrays, uh, 10 years, well, this thing, study started in 2001 or so, 2002, and so on, microarrays up to now, very fancy RNA sick, uh, whatever they can do on uh, NIH, microbioma, integrated microbioma studies, everything they can do on this, uh, um, on the, the, that population. As a result, we are, as a center, we are basically, we are a private, uh, non-profit organization that's, uh, it, it, we're basically a research, ICT research lab that it's uh, dedicated to support many things, and one of these is biology. And as a 
since they were the, the institution with uh, the largest the sort of competition of facilities around, we've been the one that we've been chosen to have, um, well, basically we've been chosen to install in our place the uh, sequencing facilities that were supporting the projects I was describing before. So effectively, we are running the largest, which is not huge, but the largest sequencing facility in Italy connected to these projects. And as a result, we have, and on top of that, we, as I said, there were the previous studies that, that were acquiring data in various ways. We have um, basically order of a petabyte of data in a way or another connected to these large studies. On top of that, now we start to have uh, um, studies that are connected with cancer sequencing. And uh, in there we are moving to a more general, I mean, no, not only omic kind of data, but also things like uh, biomedical -imag imaging and so on. I will mention that in a moment. Uh, as, a, as a lab, our goal is to basically provide a consistent computable platform that is able to handle large amount of heterogeneous data for a reasonably long time. And, uh, and, and develop a scalable infrastructure that is able to operate on these things. And uh, in a way that's sort of producible, traceable, traceable and, uh, and basically uh, maximize the outcome from the point, assuming the outcome is the right word, the results that you can extract from the data we being acquired. Now, uh, now we'll talk a little bit about what are the peculiarities of that intensive biology, which will be basically the focus of my talk. One has to do with the heterogeneous data, and the other one has to do with computable data provenance. I will try to explain what I mean with these things. Heterogeneous data. What you see here are the technological evolution of microarray technology and the, the, the big uh, image on the left. And on the top and the right is the usual sequencing, uh, well, basically the, the, the decay of cost for genome sequencing time. Now the point here, versus this one has to do with microarrays, and it goes from TACMAN to the latest uh, high resolution uh, microarray technology like FFI matrix, well, likely Illumina, one million and so on. Now the point is that um, the progenia project started in 2002. In 2002, they didn't have a clue of the fact that it would have been possible to actually have sequencing on a large, large means thousands of people done within the time frame of the project. Okay, so the, the so the result is that you acquire, you're doing longitudinal study, you're acquiring information and population, then you need to put all these things together. But if you want to be able to do this, you have to have a system of handling the data and uh, being able to um, accommodate for data evolution. And you cannot predict it from the beginning what this evolution will be. Um, continuing this line, now, now we are moving towards uh, providing, uh, this specifically for cancer-related stuff, providing a morphological context in which the specific um, deep molecular analysis has been done, which basically means we have uh, FFP, basically a block, blocks of material have been, of uh, tissue have been sliced, and then on this slice has been seen by an atomal pathologist, and an atomal pathologist says this is the region with the, which is affected cells, these are the cells were not affected. Well, I want to extract uh, genomic material from here and here as a control, but then you need to be able to connect these two things together, okay? And, uh, and things can get even more interesting if you start to consider that where, the, especially towards clinical things, where that thing, that specific sample has been extracted. Um, by the way, we're, we're involving things that so we do the, the thing on the left in our clinical things, and we, we're doing things on the right in the bio, bio research stuff, and now we start to bridge in, at least at the center, between these things. Now, the, the, the point here is that um, th th there are, there's a very deep dependency of the result, the molecular result, for instance, all the way back to where you have actually acquired the sample. And many, many steps during, many, many, many of the steps of this complex thing are actually, um, it's actually software doing something. In principle, could be, for instance, uh, CAD, CAD analysis on the images that extract the regions where you should extract the material. So you have multiple situations where you have, so you have your final result is actually not a direct measurement on this general world, but the result of a complex succession of um, operations that have been, computer operations that have been performed. Now, 
let's go to the next point I think is interesting, which is computable data provenance. What you see here is a typical uh, pipe workflow of, um, of, a of a people of varying calling workflow. Now, the, the, the reason I'm showing this is because um, basically the defectiveness of this thing, or better, this object is something that takes raw data at the beginning, I mean, sequencing data, and it output has some important, some, some um, potentially actionable result on the, at the level of the, what the variant calling results. Now, but within this, you are, um, the, the, you have the computing, the computing, the process that computes these things. And that process is characterized by effectively three time scales. One has to do with the data acquisition technologies, which basically is about three years or four years or so. It means that maybe three years from now will be better to use, uh, say, next next generation sequencer, which will, will be more precise in certain sense. So all the previous data will become obsolete if you can, if you have still have the sample, the biological sample to analyze. The second one has to do with the algorithmic evolution, which is ordered six months or so. And uh, the third one has to do with, in the algorithmic, in, in, the, in the, the part where you do the, your um, computation, usually you are not doing measuring a track, but you're referencing to something else, which means that you're, even the reference has an evolution itself, so introduce another time scale in the project. The thing I'm trying to stress here, that this is very, very different than the situation you had, say, in physics, or anything where you do a physical measure outside of a process that's understood in a, in a theoretical sense. Because, I mean, there, the world pipeline, if you do a measurement, a real measurement, I mean, sorry, a measurement of something, like, so for instance, you do a CT scan, okay? You do a CT scan, then you have the image of the CT scan. When you look at each voxel, you can, the, the measure of the voxel is the result of a processing of data that came from the detectors, which is well described by the, the, the physical understand, physical assessment, the physical theory, physics theory, understanding of what we are doing, what we are doing, and the actual machine you're using, except if you have some pathological cases, the actual machine you're using, it's only reflected in the error bars. It is, that is the voxel, not the error bar. Here is different. You do not have a reference uh, theoretical understanding underpinning of what you're doing. You just are uh, just using the best of the state of the art of doing things. And that implies that your result is not really your result. It's your result with this specific pipeline. I'll give you an example. These are the comparison between uh, the results of using um, variant calling pipelines using um, different variants of BWA and the variant caller. And uh, the point is, no, it's, it's, of course, you have like, 158,000 SNPs on which the thing agree, variants in which the things agree, but there are like about 2,000 up there which they don't, and there is no guarantee that the thing you're looking actually is in the part where everybody agrees rather than the, the part of it, which it comes out for the latest and, and best solution. So in a way, the, uh, so, and, and, and typically, and the, the problem with the e-software is not, are not a reflection of better understand, theoretical understanding. It's typically, on top of being better from uh, generically being able to handle more cases, but they also incorporate previous knowledge on how you do things. So it's a sort of evolution that feeds on what you, the, 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 the general consensus of what the right thing to do. So it's uh, complex. This is another example on the reference database. Um, the, the thing on the, oh, sorry, on the left, is just a sort of, it's a, as a proxy of the complexity of the genome, it's the number of DSNPs and DBSNPs as a function of time, okay? Which is, you can see there at certain points if you have to do something in 2010, and then you wait 2012, you get a definitely difference in your reference. The thing, the curve on the right is the, um, the, avail the available bacterial genome number of available bacterial genomes in database are known genomes of bacteria, okay? As you can see, for instance, there, there is a steep jump somewhere between uh, July and June, sorry, July and Jan July 2012, 2012, and January 2013. Now, this is not insignificant. For instance, this, is an, 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 th this image here is uh, how the the variation of taxonomic profile of a particular sample, microbioma sample, when you change your reference. 
So there's a bacteria that was all classified as something, as the bacteria, bacteria of the uniform, if you did this in November 12, 12 2012, 2012, sorry. And, and this is the result of the change if you do the same thing in 2013. Okay, so you can have, so, so if you are looking at something where there is a very fast evolution, for instance, you reference it in the genome that has been acquired in um, microbioma, you can have big impact. Now, so, uh, if, but to summarize what I've seen now, uh, what we, we just told, I just described to you, the, the first things are, okay, so you need to manage heterogeneous data. Uh, because there are many data sets you know and probably many data sets you don't know, data types that you don't know that will come up. Uh, you um, want to have um, what's called an actionable data provenance graph. You don't, not only you want to trace everything you've done, but you want to have it in such a way that you can then work on this description at the level, meta level. So you can first rerun the same analysis if you know there is a better, say, aligner that you want to replace. So you want to redo the same things, but by changing parameters, so changing reference, and doing things. Um, of course, you want to have data-intensive computing, because these are data-intensive problems. So you need to have scalable computing tools that are able to handle this. And uh, the other aspect is that you want to be able to support automation, okay, but also made automation, in the sense that you want to be able, especially if you start to have thousands, tens of thousands of samples of results of pipelines, then you need to go on a higher level, being able to work on these things and say, okay, find all the ones that have been, say, for instance, where we use with specific pipeline, I want to rerun them with this uh, different parameters and then compare results. Or I want to do check, consistency check, whatever you want to do. So these are the things you want to know. So now, this is the general architecture of, um, of the system we set up which is basically, and this is a very schematic view, but effectively we have our one level of automation where we are able to drive the rest of the system at the meta level. Then we have, um, well, okay, the sample submission I'm just mentioning here is the part that has to do with limbs. I mean, basically to talk with, uh, where, where the actual sample came in the picture and where you deal with uh, uh, where that particular limbs, where the particular data sample has to do with what specific study and so on and so forth. Then the, the other important, the other aspects of this box are um, we have um, a metadata manager, a system that is able to basically maintain the connection between the um, artifacts that produce and now these are being produced at the flow of steps that went from one to the other. And uh, we have a workflow manager in a sense that it's something that actually drives the actual workflows that compute data to, to extract and compute data. And the workflow manager then of course drives compute engine and various things. The, um, of all this picture I will only talk about in the following slides on the metadata manager and the workflow manager. Um, oh, I wrote there, it's because we, we try to decouple between the actual physical location of files and their logical names, which start to be, again, when you start to have really medium to large size data sets, uh, moving things around is something that happens and you want to know where things go, or went, actually. So let's talk about the metadata manager. As I was saying before, what we are trying to, we're trying to get are actionable data provenance graph. Basically something where you have a full tra tracing, sorry, of the graph the operation perform. And uh, you, so you can reconstruct for any, any given object you have in your, you know, generically called computational biobank. You want to be able to go back and retrace all the steps that were done to, to, to um, extract information exactly what it was done and so on. And uh, once you have these things, of course the, the obvious thing to do is you, first you automatically check for missing steps in the analysis. You do um, automatic quality consistency checks and so on. And uh, you can confirm results using different approach. You can scan through your dependency graph and say, okay, for this one we have micro results and we have sequencing results, so check if the things are consistent. Right? And and lots of other more mundane kind of task. So the system we have at the moment, it's called Omero Biobank. It's uh, it essentially, 
to aim to, go to maintain to, to, to support the model I was describing before. So you want him aim to be flexible so that you can easily add new data type data at least the meta description of your data object and uh, to um, and able to also be able to support the um, the graph of action that brought from one artifact to the other. Okay, so it's effectively it's something where you not only maintain information on these things, but also provides you the high-level interface to, do, to, to, to query the graph efficiently. Okay. The Omero Biobank is a specialization of Mero, another project we're involved to, which is a, a basically a system that's designed to do data management for large-scale uh, um, biological experiment, mostly things have to do with bioimages, but the core of the system can actually be um, specialized the way we have done. And on top of that, now we're moving a situation where we actually have to have, at the same time, value images and uh, other kind of data. The, the way we describe the, um, the action, it's by basically saving histories of uh, workflow runs. Okay? And uh, the, um, and it, the, the, well, the point is that once a result is obtained, you effectively save it in the database, save it in the meta system, and with it, you save the full history of what was the specific run that produced it, so that you talk with the workflow engine that was described before, dump the trace, and save it there. Okay. Now, as an example, this is the, the, the simplest thing. Well, one of the simple things. You, you start with a flow cell. You have, you have samples somewhere, physical samples, I mean biological samples. You start, you, you put them in, uh, you, you probably you tag them, you do something, you put them in a flow cell, then you, you sequence, and then you want the other end, you want to demux and obtain the specific fast queue for, the, uh, for, for each given sample, okay? Uh, so if you do that, this is the kind of graph, if you track everything, which we do. This is the kind of graph you, you comes out. And this is a small thing there. That if, you, if you start to look think at the bigger level, when you study the full studies, then graphs become bigger and bigger. So you need to be able to uh, process graph in a reasonably efficient way. Now let's go at the, now talk about the workflow manager. Uh, as I, from what I told you before, it, it basically what we would like to have, the workflow manager needs to execute and record operation on, on data that's been done on data. Uh, the, the kind of workflows we're discussing are the same that we've described, we discussed today. I mean, typically they are sort of one direction. There are no loops, there are nothing particularly com so complex, but they, but they are there. But they're multiple steps. Um, should support, in our case, should support scaling. So we should be able to have in the same, with the same uh, framework, we should be able to put operation, let's say, standard black boxes and distributed black boxes, or um, let's say, uh, tools that are used, say, for Hadoop-based tools or whatever. And uh, the other thing is that they, we need to support somewhere the fact that they actually are working. Um, let's say, the, the way things were, usually work is that we have biologists, well, bi let's say, biologists versus, bioinformaticians bi were actually biologists, would do the uh, we design the pipelines. We work on the pipelines. They need to be able to work on these things easily. I mean, in, uh, in, a, in a sort of effective and uh, reasonably easily, in a reasonably easy way. And then once these are consolidated, they go back to the, they they become something that's run in a sort of automatic way. And um, keeping this in mind, and the fact that we took this decision well three years ago, two years ago, I forgot. We we want to use it. we basically extend a galaxy. We start working on galaxy, extend a galaxy to accommodate for these uh, things. Uh, probably all of you know what galaxy is, but I will will summarize it again. It basically is a web-based platform to do data-intensive biomedical research. The, the real um, good marketing point of galaxy that just came out at the time where next-generation sequencing data were common. But using pipelines was difficult. Using the standard pipelines was difficult, but it would have been like command line tools or complex command line tools. And they just inserted in the middle with something that looks simple enough and uh, visual enough that can uh, be used by, well, man, can be used in a standard sense. Um, the other strength is that it's very easy to integrate 
basically all the standard command line tools available. And um, okay, and Express, as I said before, Express workflow now is a very reasonably simple, a very simple model for workflows. Now, the features that are important is that one, it's biology friendly. Um, basically, which as I said before, it's important for us because I mean, we we have a sort of product, a sort of design mode where people tend to uh, the, the, you need to have biology to be able, uh, actually able to use these things, and uh, it. Just it, it by design supports traceability or reproducibility as a concept of history, as a as a set of things that will be useful what we're doing, and uh, it can be controlled through a, a REST API, which we use for the automation. So what we did was basically extended uh, Galaxy by, um, by basically to support mechanization by uh, working on the REST interface, writing uh, packages on the, that we'll be able to interact with the interface in a sort of programmatic way. We added a computational support for scalability. Basically, we extended so that even things like, um, let's say, tools that were expected to, uh, to use HDFS or HDFS-like file system were not, uh, will not easily work with Galaxy because Galaxy has a view of the world which basically I have a directory somewhere and I can access it. And it, our data sets are a single file. So we managed to extend Galaxy so it can easily handle that. So now we can have pipelines where you have uh, steps were done in a sort of regular way and steps were done on HDFS or in a sort of distributed fashion. And by the way, the, this work works with um, with Hadoop, but it will work with the Spark, will work with anything, with Adam, for my manners, anything that, that's, uh, that has the same view of the world. And uh, the other thing we did, with, which is again still in progress, is we're extracting, we're in, um, extending in such a way that it would be easy to get metrics on uh, what happens when you run the specific, the specific step in the specific workflow. And this is useful not only for, uh, say, statistical, I mean, to, to have an idea of what's going on, to find bottleneck effect. But also because we, uh, part of our time is also develop, uh, it's also devoted to developing new tools. And uh, if you have a large set of histories run where you know a reasonable level of details, how things went and what, how long did it take to do any given step, then you can use that to compare not only at the level of results, which you can do easily, even the, the are meta-level processing things, but also the level of uh, what actually, what, what, how actually the various steps compare from the point of view of time spent and so on. Now, I'll finish now. It's, the, the take home, well, the, 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 there are two take home messages for one. One is that it doesn't take long to, um, to get collection heterogeneous rated raw data, and you have to handle that which is, uh, seems trivial, but it's not. You, 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 at the beginning, it's not as uh, you would expect it to be. And the second one is that it is important to have computable data provenance. Um, computable means that you can uh, not only reprocess the same thing, but you can query and work at the meta level on that, because that sort of extends the live life, the, the, the actual useful life of your raw data. At a certain point, that data will become obsolete because the technology used to acquire it, it it's obsolete. But in, while that's not true, you can have a situation, especially if you have lots of it, and you have, um, uh, you have, query, uh, you have um, questions that come up afterwards. It will make it be able to do this kind of operation is useful. And as I was mentioning, we, I, I sort of very briefly give you an idea of what kind of things we are trying to build or we're building to um, accommodate, I mean, to, to support this kind of problems, support this kind of features. These are the people who actually did the work. I'm mostly talking, not very well. And uh, thank you, and I'm here for questions if there are any. No. <laughs> Yes. No, but it's not the. Uh, this is, we, we use Neo4j with uh, with Omero, 
to handle. Basically, we have a dual view of what it's it's a sort of dedicated system. It's not it's not used for computation. The I mean, we use the uh, Neo4j graph engine to allow us uh, to very fast, very quickly query the on a, on a graph view the data contained at the our meta description what we have. It's not a huge database that you need to have to process with uh, some distributed way. But it's, um, but on top of that, well, in any case, we use that as um, um, basically, as I said, to provide an abstraction on top, or to, to provide an efficient, an efficient implementation of abstraction on top of our path so that you can then query and work on that. Spark and other kind of parallel processing things do you have in production and how much of them are just uh, trial so far? Well, um, we have the, we use Hadoop in production. I mean, the, since uh, 2013, we actually have completely automated pipelines that run from the moment, basically the moment you insert the flow cell in the machine, in the sequencing machine, then it goes in automatic and once that, that, that is done, we'll trigger uh, successive uh, Hadoop base processing that will process the data and generate uh, things. Um, we have we are developing Hadoop based tools since 2008, and uh, initially for things that have to do with genotyping, supported genotyping for automatic data sets and so on, and uh, we use that at the time. <laughs> no, no, it's not used. To, uh, I mean, automatic data is not that uh, used anymore, not as much. And, uh, and then we start developing a liner, CO in particular, a liner that's completely a Duke base. And now it's in, uh, in a few months, we should have a new release, which is up to level with the, a more flexible uh, system. But yes, in general, we have a suite of things. Uh, we, we, we tend to um, use um, this, I mean, I do base in a way distributed computing that it either direct, either through specialized tools like SEAL, which does the land, the alignment, or uh, general purpose tools like SecPig or uh, scripts in PyDoop, which is our um, wrapper on top of Hadoop to run uh, Python jobs. Um, I would say that we, I don't know, I mean, not this, almost have, basically all the production stuff is done, it's based on Hadoop stuff. Uh, the, the way, something I didn't mention is that the way we, the, the, the system is built is that there is a sort of production laboratory production side which goes from data to generating uh, data set. And then on top of that, there is an export. Uh, we're exporting the results to specific groups and specific data. And they use Galaxy. They can, sometimes they use Galaxy in a traditional way. So there they will not use uh, Duke based. But the, uh, um, the alignments of, well, basically, as I said, the, uh, the production things is using this Galaxy interfaces and the uh, Hadoop based uh, computational engine. Quick question. Well, can you give any estimate as to how much uh, the speed of you guys are going from playing the cells to being generated the raw cell sheet on the system? Uh, well, wait. Are you using Hadoop for this? Uh, we, we, we have two major advantages. One was, I mean, Okay, now, now we are down to less than a day. But it's just a question of how much computing, how, how much computing you want to give. So, so but the, and the second thing, what really changes, what really change, is that we switched from a situation where we had to de devote about three, four people to running pipelines, production pipelines. Now we are down to one, which basically only looks at things that are okay, looks, look, looks at logs and so on. So the putting together, uh, scalable data processing with automation and uh, automation in a way that you can then trace and everything else has sort of solved um, a large amount of uh, where, where the, the actual problem in running this, the, that part of the system. Yeah. 